I don't even remember what we're supposed to talk about. Twitter for Mac. <laughs> what? Twitter for Mac. Well, remember Twitter ah, for Mac? That's a good topic. <laughs> yeah, that's a great topic. So they canceled it. They murdered it. They took it out back um, and they disposed of it. And you've been talking about sort of the the larger theme of apps on the Mac for a while. But Twitter, I think, is something that's been near and dear to all of us. What was your reaction? Well, I wasn't surprised because it's, a, you know, the writing's been on a while for a long time that they've never really, or at least in recent years, they have not really put significant effort into the Mac client, the native Mac client. And I think the most significant tell, and I'm going to forget which year it was which, but the, there was a year where Apple added system level integration with Twitter accounts and that Mac OS 10, you know, which was the name of the OS at the time, you could enter your Twitter account in system preferences and set what kind of notifications you want. Do you want notifications for DMs? You want them for mentions, blah, blah, blah. And then you'd get these notification center notifications at the system level. And I thought the big tell was that even if you had the official Twitter for Mac client installed, when you clicked on one of those notifications, it would always open the the Twitter website. Yeah, It never went to – and I can't think of any other – a, a app or service I use where if you have a native client installed, usually that's where the notifications come from is the native client. But uh, uh, why in the world would you not want this? And I remember asking around and somebody at Apple told me more or less that's the way Twitter wanted it. And that was that. You understand Facebook because they have no native client, but Twitter had a much better option right. available. Right. So Twitter for Mac, it was originally, if I recall, uh, Lorne Brichter made Tweety and then he made Tweety for Mac including Twee, which was his version of UIKit rewritten, I'm assuming, in OpenGL uh, for the Mac. Uh, and then yeah. he got bought by Twitter, and that became Twitter for Mac. I think so. And it, it, somebody on Twitter, there was some sp speculation uh, or, or just recollection of the timeline where I think Twitter for Tweety for Mac 1.0 was not written with his, Lauren's TW UI yeah. kit, whatever. But 2.0 was, but 2.0 was the first one that came out after Twitter acquired it. So yeah. I don't know that Tweety 2.0 ever shipped. I think by the time, you know, it was going to be Tweety 2.0 and it turned into Twitter for Mac 1.0. And that was the one that was written with Lauren's crazy <laughs> UI kit. And it's, we could go, I mean, we could just go ask Lauren, I guess. Lauren Brichter, you created Twitter for Mac back when it was Tweety for Mac. What made you want to make a Mac Twitter client? It's super simple. I needed a, a Mac Twitter client. Uh, I use Twitter on my Mac a lot. The, I, I use Twitterific. I mean, tw Twitterific was, was was sort of the only show in town. It was an awesome app. But I made, you know, the, the problem was I had a, I had three Twitter accounts, and Twitterific only lets you use one at a time. And yeah. I was, it just drove me nuts signing out and signing back in. It was just it's like a pet peeve. So I needed an app that let me uh, use three three Twitter Twitter accounts at the same time. And you couldn't, you, you couldn't just make an app either. You made uh, TWUI. Is it Twee? Is that it? Was it the way you pronounce it? So, th so that was uh, that. That was for the, the version two. Version okay. one used version one used AppKit. Okay. Yeah, it was it was almost a, a normal Mac app. I mean, it was a little weird. So there was some unconventional UI stuff. But yeah, no, that, 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 that's the only reason I made it. I needed it for myself. And the reason you went to TWUI was just to make it easier to maintain cross-platform or. No, so uh, basically, like writing Twitter for Mac or Tweety for Mac 1.0, I wrote it in AppKit, and like by the end, I was just like banging it, banging against the walls. <laughs> like, it, it, like AppKit had a very low ceiling for doing anything in, even remotely interesting. Okay. Um, and UIKit was like this this new thing, and I thought it had some good ideas. So I was like, you know, a lot, I'm going to just make a UI framework sort of inspired by UIKit, and build an app uh, based on that. And, and that you, let me do some uh, some other cool stuff. And you didn't write it purely in OpenGL. No, no, I, w I wasn't that crazy yet. If I did it today, yeah, I'd probably do something like that. No, but it was, it was I wrote it on top of core core animation. It, while Lauren was doing it, it was under active development. Yeah. It was forward thinking. It was not like a generic Coco UI elements app, which you know wouldn't necessarily be a bad way to do a Twitter client. It was I, it was a little. Uh, non-standard, you know, and you get, it's easy to get mixed up as we talk about native apps and what's good about native apps and then talking about standard UI controls and non-standard.
standard UI controls. And there's a, a mushy m m middle there where you could have a truly native app where it's not just a, a web view in a container, but it's non-standard in ways that would provoke, let's say, debate. <laughs> Even before Twitter for Mac, mutual friend Craig Hockenberry had made Twitterific for Mac. I think he claims he got the idea in a shower. That's true. Um, it, whoa. It, God, it's been so long ago. I don't even remember what year it was, it, but quite a while ago. Um, yeah, it was it, it, it was at the, the beginning of Twitter when um, we were all kind of trying to figure out what it was. And some people had done some like widgets. In fact, a guy, I know Ben Ward had written a thing called Twidget, which was just basically a widget for you know the Mac OS dashboard back when Mac OS dashboard was the thing. And he wrote that and I was like, yeah, that's kind of a step in the right direction, you know, getting it off the, the Twitter website. But I thought, you know, it'd be better to have an app to do that. So I I was literally taking a shower <laughs> and thinking you know, it wouldn't be that hard to, you know, take a, you know, a, a table view on the on the Mac and, you know, hook up some of the networking classes and grab some stuff from Twitter's brand new API. I mean, the API was probably like a month or two old. It wasn't wasn't uh, something that had been out very long. And, you know, it's like in a in a day, I had something that worked. In a week, I had something that kind of did what we wanted it to do and then like a couple more weeks were spent, you know, doing the design of the app and, you know, just taking, basically I built a prototype in a, in a week and we all were like, Oh yeah, cool. And that was the uh, first version of Twitterific. And that's what I was using uh, to, because right. the native experience was much better than the Twitter website always has been much better. And it just felt more efficient to read. You know what I mean? It just felt like all these shortcuts that, and you can get them to work in a web view, like using the space bar to, to page down in the view and drag and drop, being able to just drag a tweet if you yeah. wanted to copy the tweet into an email or something like that. And all the things that you would think, you know, that's the whole point of, of native software to me is that, the, and it really does date back. I, I you know, you can say, well, keep talking old fogey but it really does date <laughs> back to the the original mac in 1984 where there was a set of standard ways to do things and and prior to the mac like in the dos world and in the apple II world every app had different ways of doing everything from selecting text to saving files to opening existing files there is no consistency between any of that stuff and then once you learned the mac way of doing something like you you if you could became proficient at MacWrite and you could use MacWrite as a word processor. And then the first time you, if you opened Mac paint to do a drawing, which is a totally different task than a word processing, you already knew how you'd be like, well, I bet I can open a file by going file open. Yeah. And I'll bet the com shortcut for it is command O. And I'll bet when I want to save, I can just type command S and it's a shortcut to file save and et cetera and so forth. And all of these things that you would guess based on using apps X, Y, and Z previously, now when you're using app W, all of these things that you guess, I'll bet this is the way I do whatever, that usually is the way that you do whatever. So they, initially, Lauren got hired by Twitter, and they hired a few other people. And Ben, I'm going to mispronounce his last name, Ben Sanofsky, who works on Halide yeah. right now. He was one of the early uh, Twitter for Mac developers. Uh, yeah, so um, Lauren came on, uh, it was or, or mid to 2010, and uh, so in, if you read in the uh, launch post for Twitter for Mac, that uh, w the acquisition was mostly about the iPhone app, but uh, Twitter for, Tweety for Mac came along with it, and so uh, around October of 2010, um, periodically Twitter would have Hack Weeks, uh, like maybe once a quarter, and so that's when I started nudging Lauren, like, so um, what's the current plan around uh, Tweety for Mac? And uh, uh, eventually he sent me over a build of what, what would later become TUI, which was the um, yeah. uh, UI kit for Mac, but uh, it wasn't really like, it was It was basically a table view, wasn't any actual Twitter in it. And so I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. Just scrolling through it was amazing. And so for Hack Week, uh, him, me, and uh, Doug Bowman, who's Stop on uh, Twitter, who is at the time the d design director of Twitter, uh, we all teamed up and uh, basically built something for Hack Week is like, a, hey everyone, check this out. 
And then uh, January with a Mac App Store just sort of lined up like, let's let's do it. Let's go for it. And so, yeah, and then the rest is history. So, so what, what was it mm-hmm. like in terms of attention to the Mac App? Was it sort of like just uh, a bonus that they got along with Twitter for iOS? Was it uh, an anchor around the neck that they got with Twitter for iOS? So I was never in the C-level suite on any of the conversations about how they truly felt. Uh, but it was... It was always kind of a, uh, you know, Google has 20% projects. Yeah. This was always a 120% project of once you're done with all of your work, we're going to give you your nights and weekends, uh, you know. And it's really a testament to a lot of the people who love the app uh, in inside the company who would go on to spend, uh, in some cases, uh, their holiday time off uh, building in updates. Um, so... Uh, you know, I think that it never really received all of the support it needed, okay. but um, yeah. Paul Haddad from Tapbots, uh, you were doing Tweetbot for iOS and you decided to do Tweetbot for Mac and sort of what led you to that decision? Um, well, it's a mixture of basically two things. One, we use Mac all the time and Tweetbot all the time. And two, just a lot of people were asking for it. And the uh, you know the Mac and the iOS apps work really well together. Being able to uh, sync your position between the two apps is really convenient. So Twitter for Mac was already on the market when you launched Tweetbot for Mac, and you still thought there was still demand for it. You still thought it was a good business to go into. Uh, yeah, I think like I said, the the fact that they work the the iOS and the Mac app work so well together, and we did get a ton of requests for. A Mac app uh, to go along with it. So yeah, there's definitely a, a lot of requests for it and a lot of demand for it. So now you had Twitterific on the market, Tweetbot on the market, and what felt like abandonware Twitter for Mac on the market. Yeah, yeah, and it it just you know, and that's why I say going back to the beginning, that's why I'm not surprised that they've done this, but it still is angering to me at least that rather than look at the problem of, hey, we've let this app stagnate, let's fix it. Let's throw some engineers and designers at this and do a great 2018 native app that they're just throwing in the towel. And I really do think that on the desktop, I I, I know Facebook doesn't have it and Facebook's a very different service. I, I know Instagram bizarrely doesn't even have a native iPad app. They just scale the iPhone app up. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. You can look at them and say they're successful, but I don't think they're successful because of that. I think they're just successful despite that. But to me, Twitter's different, at least for active Twitter users. It's, it's you know, it is so much better with a native app, a good native app. It feels like communal IM, and we're used to having, all the way going back to iChat, we're used to having mm-hmm. IM clients on our desktop. Yeah. There's a quote here, uh, Dan Fromer, who's been on my podcast many times, I'm sure you know him, he's at Recode now, because Jack Dorsey responded to my tweet on Twitter, and it was kind of funny. His his response was so bizarre, because what I wrote was, it's unbelievable how great a native Mac Twitter client Twitter had when they acquired Tweety. It's just unreal (laughs) what they pissed away in favor of a shitty web interface. And then Jack wrote me on Twitter and just said, our desktop web interface isn't that bad. (laughs) <laughs> but we did decide to focus all of our client efforts on mobile and tweet deck and consistency between. I think that's so telling that Jack Dorsey said our desktop web interface isn't that bad. Yeah. He didn't say it was like, great. Yeah, he didn't use any prideful language. Right. And I know that one of the I, I don't I can't say I know Jack well, but I know him from before, you know, he he co founded Twitter and and you know made it big with Square, oh, yeah, Square, the other payments company. But I know that he cares about design. I mean, you know, look at the little Square, you know, interface readers and you look at the Square software when you do it. It's all really beautiful. He does appreciate, you know, good design. And Twitter in the early days used to reflect that. And it's just baffling to me now that it doesn't. Anyway, Dan Fromer's tweet, I think is so good. Uh, responding to me and Jack, uh, Dan wrote, Twitter on the web feels like a static product like something you open, read, and close. Twitter for Mac made it feel alive, a never-ending conversation in a way even the best mobile clients don't. Really too bad. And that, to me, I can't say it any better than that. And it's interesting, too, because they at at one point threw out all of the Tweety code and they uh, outsourced. They got a third-party, really well-known third-party development outfit to make a completely new app for them. And it was definitely a 1.0 when it came out. 
But it, it feels to me like that team would have kept working on that, even if they Twitter said, here, you take it, make it a third party app, just keep it going. But they chose to right. completely abandon it. Yeah. And, you know, and, and it comes to, and, and all sorts of other decisions Twitter's made over the years come into this, like, like there was a point, geez, I mean, I'm going to, it still feels recent, but it's probably longer ago than it was when, when they fully had supported third party APIs. But there came a point where they more or less said, we don't want people to make Twitter clients anymore. And they started limiting the user tokens, like where every client, like if you and I wanted to make our own Twitter client, we'd have to go through their developer process, sort of like Twitter's own app store. And you'd get these tokens per user and they were limiting clients to a hundred thousand of them, which, you know, if you have a hundred thousand users, your app is, is broken through the noise yeah. and is at least somewhat popular, but it, let's just say you're making three, you're selling your app for three or $4, which is, you know, quote unquote, a lot of money on mobile, well, three or $400,000. And then you reach your user cap. There's you, you, you know, that doesn't sustain years no, of development, especially people with multiple um, accounts on, you know, using many tokens for one purchase. And, you know, they've, there's some kind of, I, I, I think it's all very secretive and there are exceptions to it. And I don't think like apps like Tweetbot and Twitterific are still subject to a hundred thousand user limit, but it's not open. And, and they still, you know, for years they've added new features and they don't add the corresponding features to the APIs. So just the one that always, you know, is, is irritating to me is Twitter's polls, which yep. are a useful feature, um, have never been added to the API. So third party clients can't use them. Uh, Twitterific has a nifty workaround where if you, I forget, there's a hashtag they look for yeah. and if, or, and, or if you include the ballot box emoji in your tweet, we put some code in there that, that detects certain markers. And if it sees certain things, right, it, it just basically puts up a web view that's got Twitter's, um, poll thing in it. Yeah. So you can at least see what the poll is about or vote in it if you want, um, which is better than nothing, which is what we had before. And again, it's kind of a, it, we will be the first to admit it's, it's totally a hack, uh, but you know, it's doing the best with what we, what we've got. I mean, we wish we had m more, right. And, and I know that they're, again, you know, back to knowing people in engineering at Twitter, I know that, that there are some people who wanted to give us that ability, but you know, at, at a higher level in the organization, it was, you know, they're not, we're not important to them bending over backwards to make up for the lack of access. And it's, I think it's especially incumbent on Twitter if they're going to stop supporting Twitter on Mac to make the apps that do support Twitter on Mac as good as possible. Uh, yeah, it would be nice, but um, I don't expect it to to change. Um, you know, I'd love to have the entire set of APIs that the Twitter apps use open to everybody to use, because I think it'd be great for the platform, but I don't think this will change that in any way. Yeah. And I do think, I think that they were misguided. I think they really got thrown, this is my opinion. I could be wrong. Can't, there's no way to prove it, but I really feel that they, their early years, everything was go, go, go. And everybody thought Twitter had a, a possible, a lot of people thought Twitter had a very bright future. Who knows? Maybe they would be bigger than Facebook. Who knows? You know, it was yeah. early days. I mean, you remember there was a time where, uh, what was the uh, the one that Rupert Murdoch bought and then it went away? It was like a music focused social network. Oh yeah, uh, there were so many. There were Pounce and there was Jaiku that Google bought and um, yeah, there's a, the list went on and on. Well, social networks just seemed to you know it just seemed like they'd have like two years of going up yeah. and then and then they'd bust. But then Facebook truly blew up and became one of the you know I don't by revenue and other metrics and the time people spent a number of users around the world without question Facebook's one of the top five tech companies in the world right now. And Twitter was different from Facebook in so many ways. And that's why I use Twitter and don't use Facebook because of those differences. But instead, I feel like the lesson that Twitter's leadership took at the time was how do we how can we become more like Facebook? And then they're like, well, Facebook doesn't have third party clients. They make everybody go through their clients and they benefit from that in certain ways. So we should do the same thing. And I don't think I think that was it is true of Facebook in the way that Facebook creepily manages everything and and tracks you and stuff like that i don't think it was true for twitter i don't think twitter lost anything by having people uh, use their first party clients as opposed to just the fact that they were on the service period is good enough 
it's right. Like if you own a phone network, who cares who makes your telephone? Mm -hmm. I mean, no, absolutely. It's just the fact that they're on your network. And the interesting thing to me is I, I know somebody who was working at Twitter at the time and Facebook had the news feed, which ended up being this gold mine for them in terms of advertising right. revenue because they could just inject things into the news feed. And the obvious parallel for Twitter was the timeline. And he looked at me one day and he said, look, you're no longer our normal customer. You're no longer the customer that we want. What we want is somebody who follows you know, thousands of people, is almost followed by nobody, has no idea what a DM is, and all they want to do is hashtag American Idol. And that was like the stark <laughs> explanation of how Twitter, and that was under the Dick uh, Costello, yeah. Dick Costello era, yeah. and that's how they saw Twitter as a service. You know, and like I said, it's not surprising, you know, it, perhaps if anything, it's more surprising that they did pull the plug on it earlier. But it's still sad, though, because I'd always held out hope that somewhere inside Twitter, they were secretly working on a, on a good first party client. Do you see this as anything to do with the larger? Because like I said, you, you mentioned earlier um, on Daring Fireball, it, it, sort of the, the what's happening with Mac apps in general. And do you see this as part of any larger trend or is this specific to the mentality that is Twitter? No, I do think it's part of a larger trend. I, 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 I really do think that, and I think it's a problem for the Mac. I don't know if it's a problem for Apple in the long run, but I do think it's a problem for the Mac that there's this, there's always been a desire for cross-platform applications. I mean, and it, and it goes back, like you said, Adobe Air. You can go back to, you know, there's no Java. era when there were, yeah, Java. That was the whole point of Java, really. You know, write once, run anywhere where you could have one app and install it. And it was the, those such the previous such things though were always rejected ultimately in the market because people just didn't like the apps. And even if they're not UI critics or UI designers themselves, it, you don't have to be a, an expert chef to know if something tastes good or not. And those apps just didn't taste right and they felt weird and they often ran slow and you could tell they used up too many resources. But something has happened, I think, slowly but surely over the last 20 years. And I, I think it's I do think it's sort of generational where there are younger people who've grown up in the web era and and they're fine with everything being a a they don't really care. They the don't see the app, difference. Yeah. Right. And, you know, like Slack's quote unquote native, current native app for Mac is a perfect example of it. I don't I forget if they're using Electron or. I believe, usually you can do things. Command R and it'll reload the whole app like a web view. You can tell. Right. But it's, you know, whatever it is, it's a giant web view. Yeah. And these things all use, you know, just to open one window uses two or 300 megabytes of RAM. Yeah, because they're Chrome they don't under, use, the, under the covers. So I don't think everything that, you know, that falls on the, the side of, well, it makes sense to have a native uh, mobile app and, and on a desktop, our website is fine. There are some services like that, but there are others that I feel like, boy, that should be a native app. And, you know, something that's two way, something where you're not just consuming information, but communicating. I mean, Slack's the other example that I can think of that I use where, boy, I sure wish that they had a native Mac app because I use it enough where every single way that like drag and drop works different and text input works different and it is a daily nonstop annoyance to me. So last question, John, what do you use for Twitter on Mac? I use Tweetbot on both iOS and Mac. I love Twitterific, and I happily supported their Kickstarter campaign to raise money to redo the Mac version in a modern way, really a true rewrite from the ground up. And the Kickstarter worked, and their development really was on schedule, which is always a really, really tough game on a Kickstarter software campaign. And I couldn't be happier that it's worked and that people who love it work. But it's it's a terrific app, but it doesn't fit my mental model of how yeah. Twitter works, right? And that's to me why you want multiple clients in anything. You want multiple good text editors and you want Pixelmator and Acorn yes. and you still want Photoshop from Adobe because different apps appeal to different people in different ways. You Even know, like back contests. in the day. Yes, right. So like I use you on know. my iPhone, I use Tweetbot because I just want to triage Twitter as fast as possible, but I use Twitterific on my iPad because I want to sit down and read and I find it a more enjoyable reading experience. For one is the unified timeline. The second is the, the edit feature that you hacked together brilliantly. And the third is the, the really phenomenal accessibility support right. you've got right. in there. And that's, you know, it, it, that's why, A, you don't just want the first party client. And B, that's why you want multiple, you want a thriving market for, for multiple native uh, clients. You know? So the fact that I don't use Twitterific isn't a knock against Twitterific. The fact that both Twitterific and Tweetbot can both be successful and be so different yeah. at showing the same services stuff is to me, it, it's a great example. 
is proof positive that Twitter is infrastructure now and can support yeah. multiple, multiple manifestations. And John, thank you so much for joining me. People can find you at Daring Fireball and the talk show. Um, I think actually they're probably still listening to this week's episode because it was like 19, yeah. <laughs> 19 hours long. Thanks for having me here, Renee. Thank you so much, John. I appreciate it. I don't think it necessarily has any long-term impact on Mac itself. I think it's a lot of how people use Twitter, and uh, the Mac user base has always been significantly smaller than mm-hmm. iOS for both us and for uh, Twitter itself, so much more so for Twitter. So it kind of kind of makes sense that they don't want to spend those engineering resources working on a Mac app that most users will never use.